Yeah, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you to the organizers for your efforts in coordinating this workshop and giving us all the opportunity to discuss our research. So my talk today will surface gravity to dynamical apparent horizons. And uh, my goal is simply to give you a brief overview of some interesting results, but to stay within the allotted time frame, uh, I won't provide detailed mathematical derivations. However, if this topic is of interest to you, uh, you can find those detailed derivations in the archive paper of the same name. Um, so this is work done in collaboration with Rob Mann from the University of Waterloo and the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics and uh, Daniel Turner from Macquarie University in Sydney. We work in the framework of semi-classical gravity and because different people sometimes mean different things when they say semi-classical gravity, uh, I want to just start off by clearly stating what our assumptions are. And the first one is we assume that the classical space-time structure is still physically meaningful and that we can use a metric to describe it. And in addition to the metric, there are other classical notions uh, such as horizons and trajectories that can be used. Then secondly, we assume that the metric is modified by quantum effects and the resulting curvature is then encoded in the semi-classical Einstein equations, where uh, instead of the, the standard energy momentum terms of classical GR, uh, one considers the expectation value of the renormalized energy momentum tensor in some quantum state omega. And then lastly, this renormalized energy momentum tensor uh, describes the entire matter content, which means both the collapsing matter and the quantum field excitations it produces. And uh, this joint treatment of the entire matter content is really the, the key feature of the semi-classical uh, approach. And I should also point out that we do not make uh, any a priori assumptions about the asymptotic structure of space-time uh, or the quantum state omega, the state of NXG conditions, so whether or not they're, they're satisfied or violated, uh, whether or not there's a singularity, and in particular, we also do not assume the, the presence or absence of Hawking radiation. And uh, what's shown here on the right-hand side is an adaption or an elaboration, if you will, uh, of the original sketch by Hawking that illustrates the gravitation collapse into a black hole and its complete evaporation, um, where space-time regions that correspond to mathematical black hole solutions and physical black hole solutions are indicated uh, by those black and blue arrows here. So, you can see mathematical black hole solutions are bounded by the event horizon, uh, physical black hole solutions by the apparent horizon. Uh, and in particular, there's a, a region of the physical black hole that's located outside of the event horizon. Uh, and the region between this event horizon and the apparent horizon is referred to uh, as the quantum ergosphere. Now, one of the first, if not the first, to take this semi-classical idea seriously and apply it to the physics of black holes was Stephen Hawking. And uh, what he found was that when you take quantum effects into account, then black holes will emit thermal radiation like an ordinary black body. And so he predicted that due to the emission of this radiation, black holes will evaporate. And uh, this gave rise to a now very famous dilemma, uh, namely the informationless paradox. And in a very simplified view, you can think of it like this. Imagine that you have a bunch of things falling into a black hole. So maybe your favorite gravity textbooks, and now imagine the black hole evaporates. And if the black hole evaporates completely, then all that you're left with is the uh, uh, radiation that's emitted in this evaporation process. But now, if this radiation is thermal, that means it's uncorrelated. So it cannot carry any information other than the mass and the temperature of the black hole. And this is a bit of a problem because from the mass and temperature alone, you cannot reconstruct what fell into the black hole. But on the other hand, the quantum theory is unitary uh, so for all we know, this really tells us that information should be preserved. And maybe a, a more technical way to phrase this problem is to say that uh, if during the evaporation process, the quantum correlations are not restored uh, between the inside and the outside of the horizon, then what you'll find is that an initially pure state will have evolved into a mixed state. And this, of course, implies loss of information. And in fact, in a semi-classic analysis, you can actually ascribe this loss of information um, due to the fact that uh, these quantum correlations can propagate into the singularity within the black hole. But let's backpedal a little bit and think about what are actually the ingredients that we need to set up the informationless paradox. Well, first of all, we need a transient trap region. And uh, this region can either disappear completely or turn into a stable remnant. 
But in either case, this should take place in finite time as measured by a distant observer. And this is a necessary ingredient because it uh, provides a scattering like setting that we need to describe the quantum states in their alleged information content. Secondly, we need an event horizon. And um, the event horizon is needed because it's a, a global definition of the boundary of a black hole. Uh, and so it gives an objective observer independent meaning to tracing out degrees of freedom. And then lastly, uh, the radiation that is emitted during the evaporation process should be thermal in character. Uh, this is because of what I've already alluded to on the previous slide. Um, because if it's not thermal, then you cannot ensure that uh, correlations between the inside and outside of the horizon are not restored during the evaporation process. So this just ensures that information is not leaked out or carried away, so to speak, by the emitted radiation. Or equivalently, uh, if you go back to thinking about it in terms of quantum states, then the thermal character uh, is necessary to obtain the high entropy of the reduced exterior density operator. And of course, sometimes um, additional assumptions can be added to enable a particular formulation of the paradox, but these are really the, the minimal assumptions uh, that are unavoidable for the reasons that I've outlined below each one of them. So now the question is, well, what are the physical consequences of having these elements realized? And well, first of all, we should note that event horizons are not observable. And that's why usually people work with quasi-local notions like apparent horizons or trapping horizons. Um, but now you might say, well, okay, that's nice, but to formulate the paradox, we really need an event horizon because as we've discussed on the previous slide, uh, we need a notion that's not foliation dependent. And this is true, but it's possible to show that for an evaporating black hole, uh, the existence of an event horizon in finite time t actually implies the formation of an of a apparent horizon in some finite time ts. And with that in mind, you can actually uh, rephrase the physical consequences of having these two elements realized uh, as um, the formation of a regular apparent horizon in finite time as measured by the clock of a distant observer. And so there are two physical conditions encoded here, regularity and finite time formation. And uh, by regularity, we simply mean that the curvature scalars should be finite at the horizon. So for example, the trace and the square of the energy momentum tensor. And uh, in fact, in uh, field theories on curve backgrounds, this is actually also a necessary assumption to ensure that uh, you maintain predictability of the theory. And um, the finite time formation according to a distant observer is needed because otherwise the formation of the event horizon prior to evaporation of the black hole is impossible. And of course, we've argued on the previous slide that we need an event horizon uh, to formulate the paradox. Now, something that uh, Daniel Turner and I have shown in a uh, previous paper is that in spherical symmetry, somewhat surprisingly, those two assumptions alone actually suffice to um, constrain the near horizon geometry strongly enough to obtain a unique formation scenario, even though they seem like innocent assumptions. Um, so let's have a, a look at the situation in spherical symmetry. And in Schwarzschild coordinates, you can specify it by writing down the line element that I've given here, where uh, this function f is defined as 1 minus c over r. And c, or more precisely, c half, is the Misner sharp mass. So this is a notion of gravitational energy that's uh, enclosed within a sphere of radius r. And you can see uh, from its own definition that this is an invariant notion, uh, which is why it's quite convenient and people like to use it. And then there's one other function here, h, uh, and this is essentially an integrating factor in coordinate transformations, for example, between Schwarzschild and advanced null coordinates. And then, of course, the Schwarzschild metric, for example, is the special case where h is 0 and c is equal to 2m. And um, so with this setup, we can write the Einstein equations as three differential equations for those two metric functions, c and h, uh, where on the right-hand side, these tiles that appear are uh, just effective energy momentum tensor components. So these are really just energy momentum tensor components rescaled by some factors of e to the power of minus h. And in practice, it's just much more convenient uh, to work with these effective components because not only do they allow you to write the Einstein equations in this very compact form, but for example, you can also uh, express the curvature scalars in terms of these effective components and then um, examine the regularity conditions, for example. And what we've uh, found in, in previous papers is that uh, the solutions are actually characterized by the scaling behavior of their effective energy momentum tensor components close to the horizon. And what you'll find is that as you approach the horizon, uh, they will scale as some function of time 
multiplied by f to the power of k. But then it turns out there are only two specific values of k um, that are self-consistent, namely k equals to zero and k equals to one. And um, those are the only two classes of self-consistent dynamic solutions in spherical symmetry. And both of them violate the null energy condition uh, near the horizon, uh, and which we know uh, from, for example, from the book by Hawking and Ellis is actually a mandatory requirement to enable the formation of a trapped region as seen by a distant observer. And here uh, you can just see those two classes of solutions written out explicitly. And uh, the most convenient way to do it is to uh, write the mysterious expansions in terms of the coordinate distance from the horizon. So this is this parameter x here, which is just defined as r minus rg. Uh, and then you can write out the two metric functions as series expansion in terms of x. And um, yeah, what we found is that in field of symmetry, the, the black hole formation scenario is unique and it involves both of these classes of solutions. And in particular, at the instant of formation, uh, physical black holes are described by the K1 solution, but the behavior then immediately switches to that of a K0 solution. And I should also point out this transition is actually continuous. And what makes this continuous transition possible is that uh, for the K1 solution, the NEC is violated only outside of the apparent horizon. But for the K0 solution, uh, it's also violated up to some um, R within the apparent horizon. And that's what enables this, this smooth transition between those two classes. So now we've covered all of the context that we need to look at surface gravity. And surface gravity is actually only uh, defined unambiguously in stationary space times, where we have this relation uh, to the Hawking temperature of a stationary black hole as seen by an observer sitting at infinity. And in stationary space times, there are actually several uh, equivalent definitions and they can, broadly speaking, be categorized um, according to whether or not they're related to either the infinity of null geodesics on the horizon. So um, this is this definition here, which involves a uh, contraction of the covariant derivative of the killing vector field with its contravariant component. Um, or the other way to do it is um, by using the, the peeling off properties of null geodesics near the horizon. Um, you might also know this one as peeling affine gravity or at least I've seen it called that as well. So this is where, where you expand um, radial geodesics. Now, in uh, general dynamical space times, um, we can't use the first definition because we no longer have an asymptotically time-like killing vector. But there are other ways to capture the role of the Hawking temperature of a black hole. And um, the two principal generalizations that underpin different derivations of Hawking radiation uh, in that case, so on the background of an evolving black hole spacetime, are the peeling surface gravity and the Kodama surface gravity, um, where the peeling surface gravity is essentially, uh, if we go back one slide, this one, but generalized for, for dynamic spacetimes. It also involves radial null geodesics. And it turns out, so these two for uh, slowly evolving horizons with properties close to their classical counterparts, they are practically indistinguishable. Uh, however, and this is one of the main new results from our archive paper, this similarity actually breaks down for the self-consistent uh, spherically symmetric solutions in semi-classical gravity. And to see this, we can start by uh, writing the peeling surface gravity um, in terms of the metric function C and H. And what you'll find then is that when you do the expansion, and this is true for, for both K0 and K1 solutions, that this quantity uh, will diverge. And it's actually quite easy to see. For example, I've quoted the K0 metric functions here. Um, so remember, x is defined as r minus rg, but when you evaluate those expressions uh, at the horizon at rg, uh, it'll diverge because here you have a log term of x. If you take the time derivative of c, you end up with a term that's 1 over square root x. So that will diverge too. Um, and maybe even another way to see this is that uh, you can expare, uh, you can compare the expansion of the radial null geodesic to the, to the stationary expression. And um, what you'll find is that here you have this extra non-zero constant term in the expansion that uh, messes things up. Now, just for the sake of completeness, I should also mention that originally the peeling surface gravity uh, was introduced in panel of Gilstrom coordinates. And there are actually two possible ways to define it in these coordinates. Uh, but once again, once you do the math, you find that the, the first possible definition is zero. And for the second one, you can end up either with zero uh, 
a divergent one, so infinity, or you can uh, get a finite one, uh, all depending on the behavior of this panel of Gilstrand time T bar. But even in the, the finite case, it's not uh, reconcilable with semi-classical results. And then the second stream of possible generalizations is uh, based on Kodama surface gravity, which is defined via uh, contractions of the Kodama vector field with its covariant derivatives. Um, so this is a vector field that's usually most conveniently expressed in VR coordinates, hence the uh, plus on the H function here. Uh, it's covariantly conserved and actually gives rise to the uh, conserved current J here as well. Um, but once again, if you uh, evaluate the surface gravity that you obtain from this definition, then you'll find that uh, at the formation of a black hole, so for the K1 solution, it's zero. And then for the subsequent evolution stages, which correspond to a K0 solution, uh, sorry about that, uh, it, it's non-zero for the subsequent stages, but uh, it can it approaches the static value only if the metric is close to a pure Vajja metric. And uh, you can show that this also contradicts semi-classical results, uh, which I won't have time to dive into in this talk, but uh, the, the full derivation is detailed in, in our archive paper. And now uh, to wrap things up, what, what does that leave us with? Well, it, it looks like that when the first two elements that we need to formulate the paradox are realized, then we cannot have the third one because if the Hawking temperature is proportional to the peeling surface gravity, well, then black holes should either freeze or explode in their formation. Uh, and alternatively, if it's proportional to the Kodama surface gravity, uh, then it, it vanishes uh, at the formation of a black hole. And even though it can increase after, it can never attain the, the Hawking result that would correspond to thermal radiation. So it seems that within semi-classical gravity, it's actually not possible to formulate the standard version of the informationless paradox uh, simply because it's impossible to produce uh, or to simultaneously produce all of the necessary elements uh, that you need for the logical incompatibility that gives you the paradox. And um, I'll stop here. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. So are there any questions? Please raise your hands or type them out in the chat. Okay, I have a small question to get things going. So you mentioned that there is a mandatory uh, violation of the no energy condition at the formation of a trapped region. Is that because yeah. you're in some way already assuming that the black hole will evaporate or? Uh, no, and actually that's a good point. We, uh, we assume neither. So we assume neither that the black hole evaporates nor that the, the energy condition is satisfied or violated, but um, you actually find that in order to have a trapped region form in finite time of a distant observer, you need to violate the null energy condition. Um, there's actually a nice derivation in, in the book by Hawking Ellis from 1973. Um, and then we actually have a different derivation that we published in a 2019 uh, FISRFD article where we explicitly used spherical symmetry, but on the other hand, we did not make any assumptions about the global structure of space time. So those two derivations actually nicely complement each other. But, but the fact that you need uh, a null energy condition violation to have trapped regions in final time of a distant observer has been known for quite some time. I think it's just people often like to sweep it under the rug a little bit. So in some sense, it's related to this condition that it forms at a finite time for a distant observer, right? Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. I see. I see there is also a question from the next speaker, Danielson. Go, go ahead. Yeah, hi. So j just to sort of continue on this point, you say, well, uh, the the, uh, the apparent horizon needs to be formed. Uh, let's let's say the an external observer needs to see the apparent horizon be formed in a finite time in order to have the uh, um, in in order to have the information loss paradox. But I'm I'm not quite sure if this, if this, if this is true because you don't need to like the radiation is not coming exactly off the apparent horizon it's formed some somewhere outside that region so and 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's also related. is somehow related by by a uh, by sort of an, uh, uh, a scaling limit towards this uh, apparent horizon. Um, yeah, it's okay. it's not so much related to the radiation coming off the black hole. It's mostly related to the fact that you cannot eternally trap information um, and actually need an event horizon to do that. The only reason uh, working with an apparent horizon works here um, is because of uh, this statement here that actually uh, we know that the existence of the event horizon implies the formation of an apparent horizon mm -hmm. in, in this particular case uh, for an evaporating black hole in spherical symmetry. Um, because if you have no horizon, then it's it's impossible to uh, to trap information internally or until the black hole evaporates completely. Um, for example, here, if you consider null geodesics, uh, it's actually possible that they leave, that they exit from the quantum ergosphere. Um, because here, if you were to draw a null geodesic, so a line that would go parallel to the event horizon, you can see that you can be inside of the, the physical black hole and actually still leave if you're within the mm -hmm. quantum ergosphere. That's why you, you need not only an apparent horizon, you need an event horizon. Um, sure. But because of this statement, we can actually work with an apparent horizon in this case. Yeah, but why does it need to be? Why does it need to be, let's say, observed by a, an observer at infinity in order to uh, to have the information loss paradox? Um, well, one reason is that um, if you can't observe it, it's it's not physically relevant. But the other reason is that. Um, it's needed because otherwise the event horizon can't form prior to evaporation of the black hole. And obviously, if there's no event horizon before the black hole evaporates, then you know that there's no way that information could have been trapped. Does that make sense, or is that too fast? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm just still not entirely sure uh, what your what your underlying is. I mean, we know there are, of course, classical solutions where an apparent horizon forms and a uh, and a, but are you saying it, it cannot grow, let's say, bigger than the than the uh, uh, than the event horizon? Or uh, no, there's no no such statement that's needed for the results that we derived. And actually, in the in the classical case, I mean, it's it's incompatible, right? Then you have this incompatibility where um, the distant observer Bob actually never sees the uh, horizon form, but he can see or supposedly he can detect uh, radiation from the evaporating black hole. Um, but in, in semi-classical gravity, you, but, you but can resolve that. But the radiation is not coming off the horizon. It's coming. I mean, you, you don't even need a horizon for, for radiation, actually. Matt Vissa has a okay. paper um, with necessary and, and inessential features um, that are needed for radiation. Um, so it's, it's unrelated to, to that uh, radiation, actually. Yeah, yeah, but the thermality is related to, let's say, the the, the, the fact that, that there is a bifurcate killing horizon, etc. Um, yes, I mean, we we looked at it from from a surface gravity perspective, and of course, in the dynamical case, you can no longer work uh, with this killing definition here. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, it, that's true in the stationary case, but uh, I mean, realistically, we're really interested in evolving black holes and uh, dynamical space times that they they cause and so this this definition is, is not possible um just because you, you don't have these um time like killing vectors uh asymptotically time like killing vectors in dynamical space time mm -hmm. so here you really have to use different definitions then yeah 